Welcome, everyone. Welcome on this beautiful evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Jan Burant. I'm the conservator of works of art on paper for the Manil Collection. And thank you for joining us this evening for our program. Um, it's a lecture by Professor Margaret Holman Ellis entitled Reading Paper, A Sensory Experience. We're so pleased to welcome you for this presentation by, by our spring 2023 Manil Drawing Institute Research Fellow. A key component of the Manil Drawing Institute is our fellowship program, which fosters the highest level of scholarship and makes possible rich, interdisciplinary, object-based conversations on the drawing's mediums, history, theory, criticism, and practice. So three fellowships are offered on a regular basis. The Manil Drawing Institute Pre-Doctoral Fellowship for graduate students pursuing a doctorate in art history, the Morgan Manil Research Fellowship which supports independent projects on drawing with residencies here and at the M Morgan Library and Museum, and the Manil Drawing Institute Research Fellowship, awarded to accomplished scholars, conservators, artists, writers, or others who pra whose practice pertains to modern and contemporary drawing, and of which Peggy Ellis is our second fellow. Ellis's lecture this evening will last approximately 45 minutes, after which we'll have time for audience questions. We ask of you to hold your questions until after her presentation so that we can come around with a microphone for you. We're recording the program, so it will be available to view on the YouTube channel just in, a, in the upcoming weeks. So I'd like to remind everyone to take a moment to make sure that your cell phones are turned off and now a brief introduction for our speaker this evening. Margaret Peggy Holbin Ellis is the Eugene Thaw Professor Emerita of Paper Conservation at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, where she's taught the conservation treatment of prints and drawings and technical connoisseurship for art historians for over 35 years. She's published and presented on artists ranging from Leonardo, Raphael and Durer, um, to Samaras, Lichtenstein, and Dubuffet, with a focus on materials and techniques, including day glow colors, magic markers, and Crayola crayons. Most recently, she's begun to investigate the materials of Willem de Kooning for the Art Institute of Chicago. While at the Manil Drawing Institute, she hopes to develop an easy to use protocol for describing the color of white paper in collaboration with curatorial and conservation staff the system will have at its foundation colorimetric measurements of a range of white papers. Each instrumental color reading will then be translated into a universal color language phrase and assigned a familiar color name. Her project will add to the Manil's long history of refining the description of paper properties begun by conservator Elizabeth Lunning, continued by yours truly, Jan Burant. Peggy's recent workshop, on the topic conveying the color of paper was here in the drawing room and attended by curators and conservators from around the country. Please join me in welcoming Peggy Ellis. Thank you, Jan, for that, that introduction. I'm so glad to see everyone. Um, this is an audience participation, your participation is required, so get ready to read paper. Um, visitors to the Manil Collection and specifically to the Drawing Institute spend a lot of time looking and interpreting drawn, written, and printed marks on paper. As an example, consider the very recent uh, Motherwell exhibition, As Fast as the Mind Itself, where we saw Motherwell's search for a, quote, personal, spontaneous language of mark making, in the words of our chief curator, Edward Kopp. When we look at any written, printed, or drawn mark on paper, our brain automatically tries to untangle them into some sort of meeting. But what about the paper on which the marks appear? Just like we can decipher or read marks, we can also read the paper itself. But reading paper involves more than just eyesight. We also need to use our sense of smell, 
hearing, touch, and yes, occasionally taste. And by applying all our senses, paper's role within the work of art itself, its function, its significance, its meaning, allows us to better understand that paper plays a very significant role in works of art on paper. It's part of the picture, after all. And so tonight, I invite you all to read paper through your senses. The practice of applying all five senses to characterize paper is really not new at all. And here you see, oh, I'm going to advance this. And here you see a printer, an old time printer. And he's using all five senses, and here's taste right here, <laughs> to evaluate the characteristics of his paper. So before we do the same exercise, let us review what we know about paper on which the marks in our galleries appear. And when you go into a gallery, if you look at the works, you read the exhibition labels, or the catalog, and it, what do you learn about the paper? I suspect you learn very little. And I suspect what you learn is quite confusing. Sometimes we're told the paper's color. For example, white, ivory, cream. Or we find out that the paper is laid or wove. These terms might be confusing to you. Formation indicates how the paper was formed, and laid and wove refers to the patterns of distribution of the pulp within the sheet. You'll see this when you hold the paper up to the light, and we're going to be demonstrating this in a little, a little later on. Sometimes we're told it's textured. We're told it's pebbled, for example. And here I need my, my hand or outer, Tony. I, I want you all to feel and look at the pebble texture. You often see this in watercolors. You can pass it around from one to the other. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Um, and occasionally, paper is described by its function. We've all encountered this. For example, it's described as newspaper or craft paper. And before we start to pass these things around, I'm also going to ask you. if you don't mind. So most often, no mention of the paper is made at all, as if the marks are just suspended in air without any physical support whatsoever. Not only are the characteristics of paper substrates, prints and drawings rarely mentioned, there's a curious lack of language that exists to describe paper. And many of the terms that you do hear are vague, misleading, culturally biased, or outdated. For example, describing the color of paper as cream is a very Western concept. And let's face it, cream isn't as yellow as it used to be when we used to skim it off the bottles. Also, some consider describing, comparing the color of paper to a piece of ivory, whether new or aged, is downright archaic. For example, when we read that a watercolor is on butcher paper, can we sense, can we feel the properties of butcher paper? Do we appreciate that the artist selected on purpose a satiny, non-absorbent, and durable paper? Why did Oscar Kokoschka, in this case, choose butcher paper onto which to draw and paint? Was it because butcher paper is durable and non-absorbent? Was it the paper's non-absorbent shiny surface? Or was it the color, which is typically called buff? And the color today is surely darker than it was over a century ago. When we're familiar with the properties of Kokoschka's butcher paper, what does it tell us about his choices? 
Some might say that the choice was entirely circumstantial. Egon Schiele, who you see here, was according to legend so impoverished that he resorted to using butcher paper because he couldn't afford anything else. Now, in actuality, I think this is urban legend because uh, Sheila, we know, used Strathmore paper, which was manufactured in Massachusetts and imported into Vienna. But regardless of why he used butcher paper, whether or not it was deliberate or not, the properties of butcher paper that make it good for wrapping meat determine to a large extent the appearance of the picture itself. For example, the watercolor is all smeary. If you're familiar with butcher paper, you know that the surface is very smooth and very non-absorbent. So at the end of the day, however, many people who go into museums, art, art lovers, um, have not a clue what butcher paper is, what it feels like, what it looks like. And in fact, how many of you know what the color of buff is? Does anyone know what buff is? Buff, the color of buff, is based on undyed buffalo skins. Now, when's the last time you saw an undyed buffalo skin? Now that I'm in Texas, I have one. <laughs> so this is buff. This is the material on which the color is based. And I can guarantee that very few people have seen it. And yet we use the term all the time. And I also want to show you some butcher paper that I got from our neighborhood HEB store yesterday. So, I want to pass this around and feel. Now, this is very different from Kokushka's or Sheila's butcher paper. Um, it has a, a plastic, um, non-absorbent layer. And why it's buff is purely for marketing reasons. So that's, that's butcher paper. But you can appreciate in Kokushka and Sheila's day, um, he would have he put his watercolors on this non-absorbent side, which is why you get that really smeary appearance. Okay. All right. So, what do we sense when we learn that a work of art is on plate paper? This is a term you'll sometimes hear. Can we feel the softness and the absorbency of that plate paper? Do we know that the reason it's such a bright white is to accentuate the engraved lines of what you see here. This is William Hogarth's Prodigal Apprentice. Uh, Hogarth's printer would have deliberately selected a soft, fuzzy paper on pur purpose. And this is to pull, to reach into those grooves that are on the copper plate engraving and pull out as much ink as possible. Hence the name plate paper after copper plate. And I have a plate paper right here. I think this is still on. OK, so this is a plate paper. Got a copper plate on it. It's an intaglio print. print. Uh, I want you to pass it around and feel how fuzzy it is, OK? I also want you to listen to it. Mm, that's called the rattle. It's not got a lot of rattle, but anyway. OK, plate paper. OK. Given the difference that we can not only see, but also feel and hear, as we just did, between butcher paper and plate paper, how can it be that the contributions of paper in works of art goes so unnoticed? And I think it's because paper, and by extension its critical role, is overlooked for one main reason. And that is, we're far removed from paper today. Paper is no longer an integral part of our daily lives as it once was. Unless we're in the paper industry or in the business of buying and selling paper, we have no reason to really accurately assess its properties. 
Sorry. We humble art lovers have few opportunities to actually interact with the papers that are chosen by artists and used to create their work. How then can we appreciate the role of paper? Especially when so many of the papers that, are, that appear in prints and drawings are rapidly vanishing. Many of the papers used in the past are no longer, no longer exist due to the steady march of technology, and many predict that paper will disappear entirely. The paperless office has yet to happen. However, we're still exhorted not to print unless absolutely necessary. A good cause, for sure, but it means that we typically physically connect with paper fewer and fewer times a day. Not that long ago, paper had many more functions, and each end use required specific visual and physical properties, such as color, thickness, texture, and absorbency. And all these properties were measured by using the senses. Paper served to wrap white sugar. It was usually colored blue to make the sugar look whiter. It, it wrapped explosive gunpowder in breech-loading guns, such as muskets and rifles. It was strong, it was flexible, and it was waterproof. Don't forget the critical adage to keep your powder dry. Powder uh, cartridge paper is also used by many, many artists today, and it was certainly used um, in, in a more modern form um, by artists uh, in the early 20th century, such as George O'Keefe. Paper was made into music rolls for player pianos, and it was cut into dress patterns. Sometimes paper is making a comeback, and that's the good news. Um, sometimes, uh, in the case of these straws, you kind of question whether it's retro or echo chic, but um, it's definitely making a comeback. Uh, also, um, paper napkins. Uh, paper napkins haven't been superseded yet by cloth napkins, but I know, I know that if you go on Etsy, you're, you're often uh, encouraged to buy, buy cloth napkins. Um, uh, this, this is a, a little um, piece by um, Pablo Picasso, 1943. It was done on a paper napkin. It was Dora Maar's uh, Pet Bichon. Uh, now, you could argue that Pablo Picasso picked that paper napkin because it reflects the whiteness and the fluffiness and the softness of a, of a Bichon Frise. Um, I, did I, did, I did bring some paper towels and paper napkins. <laughs> um, but you will also see that there are many works of art where artists have scribbled on paper placemats as well. So uh, we have to take that into consideration when we're um, looking at understanding and interpreting works that appear on, on such papers. Also, for political reasons, there's a new paper on the block. It's a post-it note. Um, uh, in, in 2020, there was actually a post-it installation right here in Houston um, uh, in, in memory of people who resisted COVID. It was in Bayou City. Um, post-it notes have been, uh, is actually post-it art is an official art genre now. And uh, the MoMA added post-it note to its design department in 2004. So when paper is called by its functional name uh, when describing works of art, and here we see carbon uh, paper. It was originally known as uh, carbonic paper. Everyone immediately recognized what it was for, and what its properties were. People deliberately selected a paper that would do the job. And as we saw uh, with our printer in the beginning of the talk, they'd use all their five senses to evaluate those, those properties. So in the case of carbon paper, it had to be really thin enough uh, to catch and transfer the imprint of metal type, but it had to be dur durable enough to withstand the constant pounding um, of the keys. So let's talk about a couple other vanishing papers. 
uh, those of us of a certain age uh, know that the yellow pages have a very distinct yellow color. It's absolutely consistent. It has an absolutely consistent thickness. It has an absolutely consistent smell and a consistent sound. So I have some. These were hard to find. <laughs> Here are the yellow pages. And I want you to rattle them. Feel how thick they are. You can, you can smell them. They smell like printer's ink. Um, but, but this is the sound of yellow pages. Okay? And many artists um, actually resort to using telephone directories, don't they? And here's a piece by Franz Klein right here in Houston um, on the telephone directory. Now, how will we um, respond to, to Franz Klein's works when there's no longer telephone directories to be, to be had? And many, likewise, my generation knows all about newspapers. And I was just telling Jan tonight that I could not find a newspaper. <laughs> I searched in the garbage. I looked everywhere. <laughs> I couldn't find a piece of newspaper. Um, but we know that newspaper is very thin, it's lightweight, and it's as short-lived as yesterday's news. Uh, what I do have is newsprint, and I find it interesting that the um, the, direct, the catalog for the, the, the show at the Moody right now, wonderful show on fiber art, is printed on newsprint. Artists love newsprint. So this is newsprint, it's not a newspaper, but it's, it's definitely newsprint, it's the right thickness. This is what it sounds like, this is what it feels like. You can, you can smell it, it's, it's okay. Um, as newsprint deteriorates, as anyone can attest, who's left it out in the sun, it becomes dark and it becomes very brittle. Newsprint is 80% unrefined wood pulp. Unrefined wood pulp is basically sawdust. So you can appreciate that it becomes very brittle and very dark. And we all know that uh, by using our sense of smell, what old paper smells like, and, and the old paper that's typically giving off this smell is old um, wood pulp paper. And this is because wood pulp, or wood in general, um, contains a substance called lignin, and lignin is actually a derivative of vanillin, or vanilla. And that's what gives old wood pulp paper that old book smell. And thanks, thanks to the librarians, across the street, they allowed me to go over and rummage in the stacks so that you could smell old books. Now, don't take them out of here because I've had them in the baggies so that the smell is concentrated. Um, but you can reach in and thumb through the pages and breathe in the wonderful odor of old books and you'll see that there's a number of different odors. Uh, some of these books I suspect were stored in a musty basement. But, <laughs> okay, please be careful with the books. <laughs> but if you just fan them out, you're gonna smell that odor. Okay, this is a, a project at the Morgan Library in 2017. It was actually a historic preservation project. So it was how to preserve the smell of an old library, not how to preserve the, the library itself. Uh, and this was the Columbia University Historic Preservation Program that came down and um, monitored the smell and recorded the smell of the books within the, the Morgan Library. And you'll be happy to know that there's a number of perfumes available out there so that if you wish to smell like an old book, you can. Okay, 
So now we're going to shift base just a little bit. And we're going to, rather than looking at the papers themselves, we're going to try to appreciate or, and respond to pictures of paper. So when we see a picture, and this is a, a, a Tissot, a woman reading a newspaper, 1883. We've just looked at newsprint. Uh, in 1883 in France, well in Europe in general, there was an incredible shortage of paper making fibers. Everything was thrown into the hopper to try to come up with a substitute paper making fiber rather than cotton or linen or hemp because as you can appreciate the demand for paper kept growing and growing and growing. Uh, and so uh, here, here we see um, a picture, it's actually on very nice laid paper, cotton laid paper, um, of a woman reading a newspaper. But now that we know about newspapers, I think we can probably interpret the way the newspaper is opening, the way it's folding. We might be able to hear it as she reads it. We might be able to even feel it. So I think it's really important to be able to project or respond to pictures of paper because that helps us to enter into the picture, so to speak. We can intuit the look, the sound, the smell, and the feel of the paper just like anyone looking at a work of art would have in the past. And so here's an here's a etching by Rembrandt. It shows the, uh, mas the uh, it's, he was a writing master. He taught writing. His name's um, Levens van Koppenau. So here we have a 17th century writing instructor. Um, and he's, point he's holding up the tools of his trade, so to speak. So paper is intended for writing at this time, in Rembrandt's time, were so-called tub-sized. In other words, the, after the paper was manufactured, it was dipped into a tub of gelatin sizing, of dilute gelatin. And this, what, what this did was it created a very thin skin of gelatin um, across the sheet of the paper, and that meant that the ink from a pen would not would remain crisp and it wouldn't bleed into the paper. And because of this finishing process, the paper has a very distinct sound when it's shaken. And as I said, this is a characteristic called the rattle. And the slicker surface actually um, had another advantage, and that is um, the friction on the quill of the pen or metal nib, nib later on added a very practical benefit. As noted by many, many teachers of penmanship, the writer accomplishes much more work and his hand is less tired. So I have some writing papers here. And uh, here we are. I have some very nice writing papers, as a matter of fact. Um, these are all tub-sized. Um, this is a 17th century writing paper. This is about uh, Rembrandt's time. And I want you to feel it. And I want you to feel the satiny surface of it. Also note the beautiful color of it while you're at it. Um, I have several here that I want you to feel. And let's see if we can, hold on. Hear it? Nice and crisp. This is a good rattle. That's a good rattle. <laughs> OK. Um, so when people were looking at this print, which is on a different kind of paper, by the way, they would be able to immediately respond to the color, the feel, the sound of the writing master's paper. So, paper today. Uh, we've come a long way. Uh, paper today, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I have to back up just one bit. 
because I forgot that the opposite kind of paper also appeared in um, Rembrandt's day, and that, of course, is blotting paper. Now, blotting paper is called water leaf paper, and that has no sizing whatsoever. So I went into the paper conservation lab, and I got some blotting paper, and you're not going to hear any rattle, and you're not going to feel any smoothness, and you're going to feel something that's almost akin to that plate paper that we, we felt before. So this is blotting paper, and this would have been used to blot up the ink uh, so that it dried quickly and didn't transfer onto any other papers. So let's go to paper today. So as a sign of the times, there's a paper marketed specifically for magic markers. It is blindingly white. Um, it is um, very, very smooth. So when you, you drag your magic marker across the surface of it, it, it there's no friction whatsoever. And most, most marker inks, as you know, colored marker inks are transparent. So what happens is that the light penetrates through the transparent ink, it hits the white paper, and it bounces back uh, to, to your eye. Uh, in, even in, the, even in the, um, the very small niche market of artist papers, whiteness seems to be the desired quality today. And if you look around our galleries, I think that you'll often see that there are very, very white uh, papers being used. Um, all, another interesting functional property is how fast will it go through a printer? So it has to be remarkably consistent in its thickness. Um, so this is, this is a hallmark of, of today's, today's papers. Also, the distinction between papers for drawing and papers for printing uh, and papers for writing has become smaller and smaller and smaller. So, so one thing I do, do want to note, I don't know how I, I, my eye caught this fellow, uh, uh, Mr. Mason, W.B. Mason, wearing shades. Uh, this is a new product, um, and this is blinding white blizzard paper. And I want to I want to just very quickly show you why it's blinding white. That is because all, most papers today, but specifically this paper, have been treated or have in them. Excuse me, uh, ultraviolet uh, day, or excuse me, daylight fluorescent dyes. And what this paper is doing is actually bouncing back to your eye a lot more light than it absorbs. So this is a very co difficult concept for you to understand. Um, this paper is actually not white. It's the dyes in it that are absorbing the light and reflecting the light back to your eye more so than it actually has in it. Is that a, that's a very strange concept. Um, daylight fluorescent dyes are in Tide detergent. Get your clothes whiter than white. Um, it's in most laundry detergents today. It's in most papers today. And it's in most textiles today. So your white shirt, I can almost guarantee, um, contains daylight fluorescent dyes. Now, art lovers, what's the problem with this? We like, we like white paper. The problem is that the dyes extinguish themselves over time. And so your pop art will start to look tired. The art that depends on that pop, that liveliness between the white paper and the colors is going to start to deaden. Um, and the more you expose it to light, the faster it happens. So this is, this is a, current, a current problem. Okay, let's go back to Mr. Van Kappenau. Uh So uh, Rembrandt, as I said, didn't always print on the papers that he depicted. He also printed on Japanese tissue. He, um, he printed on a very fine Japanese tissue. And I, again, I, I raided Jan's lab to get you a piece of gompi. This is the Japanese tissue that, on which Rembrandt made his prints. Again, listen, listen to it. It's very, very thin. It's made from an entirely different papermaking fiber 
So it has a different feel, it has different ink receptivity, and it's gonna make a very different kind of print. So this is Japanese gampi. Many of our um, works of art today appear on Japanese paper. Uh, this is a Japanese kozo paper. No rattle. Japanese paper is that the rattle of gampi is because of the gampi fiber. Um, this rattle, this doesn't really have any rattle. Um, this is the most dimensionally stable fiber, Kozo. This is what all your yokoi prints are printed on because sometimes you have up to 30 blocks that have to be absolutely perfectly registered. Um, so this is a very dimensionally stable. You'll also note that one side is smooth and one side is rough. That's because of the way it's dried. Okay. This is a China paper. This is a paper that was used often for Shin Kole, and you'll hear that it has a very distinct rattle, and that's because there's clay in here. And when you pass this around, you should be able to feel that the surface of this is very absorbent and very smooth. It's very receptive to prints, to printmaking, to specifically intaglio prints. Okay. And you should be able to feel that clay-like texture. This also makes it a heavier paper. So when you get a stack of this, you're gonna feel that it's much, much heavier. So here's a little quiz. Um, this is a painting of the writing of the Declaration of Independence. What's wrong with this picture? Now we've all learned to look at paper. Um, We've all learned what its properties are. And what do we see down here? Really white, jagged paper. This is modern paper. This is 20th century paper imposed in an 18th century scene. So this is how you can train your mind. So when you see paper in works of art, you can kind of feel that it's just not right. Okay, here's Inigo Jones, great architect, right? So by now, you're gonna be able to feel that the paper he has in his hand is probably a very sturdy chart paper um, made for maps, architectural plans. And also around this time, it's, um, uh, no, I'm sorry. So, so, excuse me, the 17th century viewer would appreciate that the paper was heavy and it had substance and you probably can even hear it's much deeper resident uh, rattle. Not surprisingly, um, artists were particularly attuned to the formation of, of papers. And remember I said the formation is the way the pulp distributes across the sheet. Um, these are typically described as laid or wove. And so in the second half of the 18th century, all paper was made by hand, uh, or until the second half of the 18th century, all paper was made by hand, and it all had this laid um, appearance. Um, and this, this resulted from the um, patterns found in the paper-making mold. But after 1750, however, a new smooth surface paper appeared in England, and it was called Wove, after the woven wire screen that evened out the uh, surface of the paper-making mold. Artists were desperate to get their hands on this new smooth surface paper. And I'm gonna pass some around right here, right now. And Tony, can you show people with the light, please? The difference. And Tony's gonna take this light, because he's a very good sport. Yes. Can you all see the difference? Here's the wolf. Oh, you can't do both at once, can you? <laughs> but Jan can. Here, Jan. Jan's a good sport. There we are. Thank you, Jan. Okay. Um, so we have... Um... <laughs> All right, everyone see the difference? 
everyone sees the difference. So you can appreciate that artists all of a sudden went, hey, we got a smooth surface paper here. I want that paper. Excerpts from a letter by Thomas Gainsborough suffice. He says, I should take it as a particular favor if you could send me half a dozen choir of the new paper, it being what I have long been in search for, for making washed drawings upon, in other words, watercolors. There is so little impression of the wires and the so very fine that the surface is like vellum. And two weeks later, after receiving the wrong paper, Gainsborough writes, I could cry my eyes out after seeing those furrows. So consider the difference between a Gainsborough watercolor on wove paper, such as the one, um, wait, 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 wait. This, this, is, this is a watercolor on, on wove paper. Consider the difference between this one and this one. So the disruptions in the medium can be seen um, here, by, and they're caused by the topography of, of the paper. Across the channel, the French artist, oops, excuse me, Ang, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang, was thwarted in his attempts to get wolf paper, and that was due to the Napoleonic Wars that were going on at the time, so there was an embargo of trade between England and, and France. But Ang managed to get, in this piece up at Harvard, probably a contraband piece of Watman Turkey Wove, um, because his photorealist means of drawing really depended on having this really super smooth surface. Conversely, the American artist, James McNeil Whistler, he actively sought paper that with exactly the opposite properties. He was relishing the rough texture that would enliven his dry chalk lines in this particular piece. And he says, writing to his, he writes to his printer, enclosed I'm sending you a sample of the brown paper with which you wrapped the etchings when you sent them to me. Well, so you have some of this paper, or at least you know where you bought it. Now, it's just the paper I need for my drawings. I'm always looking for some, but all the shops have brown paper. It's rare to find this one with fine grain. So be kind enough to buy a good packet of me at once at the tobacconist where you acquired this. And this is a form of craft paper, and craft paper is very much um, light by artist and, and used, used a great deal. Um, this, is a, this is an artist, uh, Goodnow, who used it in his um, collage, and you have to wonder, was he attracted to the texture? The color is much darker now, and you also wonder if it's used for political reasons, political or social reasons, because craft, after all, Kraft, K-R-A-F-T, means strong in German. It's a very, very strong paper. And here's my Kraft paper. And I want you all, because now you're going to determine grain direction, um, I want you all to try to tear this one way and then the other way, and you're going to feel it. You're going to feel which way the paper fibers are running. And that's why paper bag manufacturing is so interesting. Okay, contemporary viewers would immediately be able to feel, sense, the types of papers that you see in this, in this portrait. Um, they would know that the architectural plan was probably on a very smooth, wove, heavy-duty chart paper, while the letters um, are on a completely different kind of paper. Which brings me to paper descriptions that we read in literature. Okay. Paper played a critical role in Jane Austen's daily life, especially as a vehicle for written communication. It's obvious from her frequent references to paper. It's ref obvious in her frequent references to her letters. And it's obvious from her frequent references to the arrival of the post. A post horn, which you see here, uh, sounded the arrival of the horse-drawn mail coach. 
and it's found in a watermark in papers intended to be sent through the post. So their appearance in several of Jane Austen's letters brings to mind what it must have sounded like when the mail came. In Austen's writing, pardon me, one finds descriptions of paper that would be immediately recognized by her contemporaries as having significant meaning. For example, in Pride and Prejudice, Jane Beck Beckett receives a letter on a sheet of elegant little hot pressed paper. This indicates that not only was it a woman's stationery, but that its sender was of an elevated social and economic status. In Sense and Sensibility, uh, Mr. Willoughby purportedly kissed and then folded up Marianne's lock of hair in a piece of quote unquote white paper. Austin's contemporaries would not have noticed the paper's color as much as its high degree of refinement, which would have been in keeping with its precious contents. The term white paper denotes a fine quality paper. So white paper wasn't necessarily white. Paper made from lesser quality rags was called brown paper, and even that could, on occasion, be, be white. So finally, Honoré Balzac, Lost Illusions. Uh, this book, this third installment, recounts the travails of a David Seychard. David Seychard is the son of an unscrupulous printer, and David is forced to perfect and sell his secret for making paper out of common weeds. You'll remember that at this time, when this came out, there was a terrible, terrible shortage of papermaking fibers. So Balzac's novel reflects the, the tremendous um, crisis that was brought about by this growing scarcity of rags in the, in the 19th century in Europe and the desperate attempts to substitute other papermaking fibers. So in the novel, burdened by money difficulties and beset with worries about his beloved wife, uh, David, he picks up, he's wandering home, and he picks up um, some nettles. Uh, and he puts them in his mouth, he's chewing away on the nettles, and he feels a little pellet sticking between his teeth. And he laid it on his hand and he flattened it out, and he saw that it was far superior to any of the other weeds that he had tried. So, long story short, after many clandestine experiments done in secret, David eventually perfected a means of making paper from nettles. So after presenting the paper to his skeptical printer father, just like that old printer we saw, I read, I read, the old man took up the samples and put his tongue to them, the lifelong habit of a press man who tests his papers this way. He felt it between his thumb and his finger, crumpled and creased it, and put it through all the trials by which a printer assays the quality of a sample submitted to him. As the skeptical printer demonstrates, the properties of paper are, and always have been, best experienced through the senses. It also indicates that eyesight alone is an inadequate means of measuring paper properties. The difficulty of truly knowing paper by assessing its properties and the severe economic uh, repercussions for getting it wrong were reflected at about the same time by a Monsieur de Fontenelle. Monsieur de Fontenelle wrote about industries in, in France, and he wrote about um, a, stationer, a stationer's job. And in this list of the connaissance des papiers, connaissance doesn't mean just knowing somebody, it means really knowing something. So he talks about it, and note that he says it's a very difficult thing to acquire, it takes a lot of study, and it takes a lot of experience before you actually get to know paper. And he goes through in that list of five um, tests in order to assess paper. It's a cognitive exercise involving all five senses. Sight, to determine the format, means the size or the dimensions. Touch, to determine the weight, and the smoothness of it, hearing to determine the degree of sizing by that rattle, or sometimes you could crumple it and listen to that, 
smell to determine how the fibers were processed. At this time, there was chlorine being introduced, so you could smell, smell the chlorine. And also, touching with the tongue, so you could assess what it was been sized with and how much sizing it really had. Um, and so these were the five senses that De Fontenelle um, suggested. Now, the people that were reading this book were people in the paper industry. They ranged from paper manufacturers to sellers at one end of the spectrum to mass consumers at the other end of the spectrum. They included printmakers, book dealers, newspaper manufacturers, magazine publishers. In other words, his audience is not this audience. So since members of the museum and library community, curators, art historians, and paper conservators, and art lovers such as ourselves usually do not make paper or intentionally manipulate it to fabricate paper-based products. Our physical interaction with paper on a daily basis is minimal. And so with prints and drawings safely ensconced in mats and in frames, it's no wonder that we are not more familiar with the attributes of paper. The determination of the thickness, the texture, or absorbency critical to the creation of well-functioning books, luminous watercolors, or velvety black prints is simply not an everyday concern for us. Nor are we held accountable if we get it wrong. So how much are we really missing? Only by becoming fluent in the language of paper as spoken by the paper itself can we begin to appreciate its part of the picture. And also, there's a lot of Jane Austen stories as well. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, I have a very special paper right here. <laughs> spy, spy paper. <laughs> so are there questions? If you raise your hand, I'll bring this around. Okay, there you go. Uh, hi, uh, what was the purpose of using chlorine? Oh, uh, yes, remember I said that there was a um, terrible shortage of linen uh, and cotton rags. Um, there was not only a terrible shortage, but they, they tended to be very dirty by the time they got to the paper mill. Um, so. Um, the chlorine was, was a newly developed um, chemical um, that was found used to bleach paper. In Rembrandt's time, the rags were uh, bleached using sun, the sun fields. Um, but chlorine really made a much brighter paper, or whiter paper, excuse me. You can, you can really see this. Um, at the turn of the 19th century, you can see that the papers are getting a lot whiter. But you can also smell it, and it really deteriorated the paper. Because if you have too much chlorine left in the paper, it produces with humidity hydrochloric acid. Um, I, actually, interestingly, I have. I have I the mic. I can't, I can't. I have the mic up here. So. Sorry. This is this is a piece of 19th century French um, wood pulp paper made interestingly on a laid mold. Um, and I think you can see probably how deteriorated it is. Um, I do not know if there's chlorine in here or not. Uh, that's a good question. Sizing um, can refer to anything that um, prevents the um, bleeding of the ink or whatever medium it is. Uh, dry media don't generally bleed, but um, on the paper itself. So um, this is old-fashioned wrapping paper, waste paper. Um, and you can see it's not sized. So this was for wrapping things. 
Um, it's, it's whatever was left over at the end of the day and thrown in. And um, so if you wrote on this and it wasn't sized, it would bleed, It'd bleed all over. Today, most sizing in, a, in tw um, modern papers is acrylic-based sizing. Um, you said that COZO was the most conventionally stable fiber, and I was just curious what physical properties make a fiber more or less stable? Ah, yeah, COZO, there's basically three Japanese fibers that you find, COZO, Mitsumata, and Gampi. is the most extreme in its movement. Uh, COZO is the most stable. Um, it really depends on the morphology of the fiber itself. Um, how much it will expand and contract um, in response to humidity. So in the case of COZO, it's, the, it's the, the physical structure of the fiber itself that makes that determination. So is everyone ready to go taste some paper? One more question. That was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I, I have one question for you about archival papers. When we hear that term, mm -hmm. what does it mean? And are there any papers that won't be damaged by natural light? So two questions. Okay. Um, archival paper today means uh, that the paper is manufactured up to, well, if you're official about it, up to a government standard. There's actually a government standard for government papers. Um, it has a 2% calcium carbonate reserve on it, in it, and it's made from something called alpha cellulose. Alpha cellulose can be refined from wood pulp, it usually is, or it can be derived from cotton linen and, and the usual paper making fibers. Um, so, so the standard is that um, it, it has this buffer to protect it from absorbed acidity, because acidity is what breaks up those long, flexible bonds of cellulose. Um, so, th so there is a standard. Um, in terms of your question, is there any paper that won't be affected by light? No. Uh, paper is organic. Uh, cellulose is organic. Paper, energy, light is energy. So energy breaks double bonds. And so all paper is going to be deteriorated by, by light, just like we are. <laughs> um, now, having said that, you, you can take certain steps to minimize and slow down the damage by light. Um, and I think most, most you know, museums are doing that. Yes, um, I had a question. So why buy the paper, and does the taste of the paper correlate with the quality of it? The, the taste of the paper will tell you whether there was chlorine. It'll tell you if there's alum rosin sizing. This is another type of sizing. I referred to sizing. There was a question of his sizing before. Alum rosin sizing was used specifically for wood pulp paper. It has a very acrid taste. Um, it doesn't, the, the, the taste of paper, also printers um, touch it to their mouths to assess how moist it is. Because you know when you're printmaking, you want to get your paper slightly damp and relaxed before it goes through the press. So the touching of the tongue can tell you a number, a number of things. It won't necessarily tell you the quality of the paper. Does that answer your question? Ah, uh, well, this is spy paper. You know when it, you get the note that says the gold's buried in the garden? You immediately eat the note? <laughs> you can have some if you like. I have a whole packet of it here. <laughs> Good. It's great for kids. <laughs> um, today's handmade paper, is it laid to or not anymore? It can be laid. Um, many papermakers are making traditional laid paper. 
Um, this is this a lot of artists like laid paper. Uh, just as an aside, when you buy your fancy crane stationery and you hold it up to the light and you see those lines, they're all fake. <laughs> It's just to give you the sense that you're buying this expensive paper. But yes, hand paper makers are making real laid paper. Yes. Thank you so much, Mark. <laughs>